Uh, I wanted to ask you about the New York Times reporters, what they reported when they were arrested, Suad Mekanet and Nicholas Kulish, saying that while they were detained, they heard people being beaten in jail. You wrote, while you were detained, you saw people who seemed to be severely beaten, intimidated. At least one person broke down under pressure, Eamon. You know, that's correct. Uh, I, I think in this situation where I was in, there was at least a little bit of uh, concern that I was a journalist. They knew that I was a journalist as well as the, the Palestinian cameraman that was with me. So we were not in the same boat, but we were all in the same holding area, so to speak. And so I could see the, the tactics of interrogation. I could see the tactics of trying to control uh, the detainees that they had. Now, it's not to say that all the detainees that were in the custody of the military had not committed any wrongdoings, but I can assure you that the degree of violence that was used to subdue these people was completely unwarranted and unprofessional in the sense that I have been in situations uh, all across the Middle East, all across the world, in different forms with different armies, and I've seen how they've treated uh, detainees. And this one was extremely alarming. There were people who uh, seemed to have been caught up in the wrong time or at the wrong moment. They had been handed over to the military. So the military was very keen on at least, uh, you know, due process with them. But in the process of trying to keep these people uh, uh, you know, obedient and subjugated to the control of the military. Uh, we saw the military uh, slap detainees. We saw them kick detainees. We saw them punch them. We saw them. Uh, one of the soldiers that I was uh, uh, observing had with him a small taser gun. He was using that to scare and intimidate the detainees into submission. So it, it was a very alarming pattern because it really highlighted a military that wasn't sure on how to deal with the crisis that it had found itself. And I think it viewed so many of us as prisoners of war. I mean, our hands were tied behind our backs with cables. Uh, our eyes were blindfolded for several hours. Uh, so the conditions were very difficult, to say the least. And that was uh, much more difficult for the people who were, you know, physically assaulted, uh, because they were essentially trying to plead their innocence. They were simply trying to say to the military, look, you know, we didn't have anything to do with this. We're not political. We happened to get caught up. But the military was having none of it. And I think that was very alarming, because that was in one area over the course of, uh, you know, nine hours. I can only imagine what is happening in places further in the country, away from the center of, uh, of gravity right now. Al Jazeera English is reporting 20 lawyers have delivered a petition to Egypt's prosecutor general alleging Mubarak family should face charges of stealing state funds. Uh, last week, news agencies reported families' wealth at some $70 billion. I wanted to ask you about that, and in this last minute, also the newly released cables from WikiLeaks that reveal that Israeli officials have long hoped that newly appointed Egyptian Vice President Omar Suleiman would eventually succeed Hosni Mubarak as president. President, as far back as this is an August 2008 cable, a U.S. diplomat quoted as saying, There's no question Israel's most comfortable with the prospect of Omar Suleiman. And it revealed that Suleiman's deputies spoke to Israeli military officials several times a day via a quote hotline. Could you respond to both issues, Amon? Yes, indeed. In fact, the news about the petition, actually, I was just told about uh, before I joined you guys here on the air, uh, and we reported it. And it, it is, in so many ways, very unprecedented that, uh, for the first time, you're seeing a lot of uh, uh, legal cases being brought against senior levels of the government. Some of it is actually within the government itself, some elements of the government turning on itself. You know, we've heard some of the wealthy businessmen, former ministers, are now under investigation, their assets frozen. In this particular case, what has made it truly historic uh, is that these 20 or so uh, people who have filed the petition, and it's important just to emphasize, they're not all lawyers. Some of them are political activists, and some of them are lawyers. Some of them are former government officials. They have signed this petition to the general prosecutor demanding that he open a case uh, investigating how President Mubarak and his family has managed to accumulate this wealth of nearly uh, 40 to 70 billion U.S. dollars, according to the reports that came out of British uh, media. And so that is why it's a very interesting development, an unprecedented legal case in Egypt to see the president being dragged in. Whether or not the general prosecutor files the case will still be very interesting. In terms of uh, Vice President Omar Suleiman, there is no doubt that in the recent years he has become more of a public figure. Uh, more and more people knew that he had become a, uh, uh, if you will, a favorite of both the West, including the European and American countries, uh, as well as uh, Israel, because he was an individual that was very close to President Hosni Mubarak. He was seen very much in line with those same policies that the president himself pursued in terms of stability and a very close allegiance and relationship with the United States. Uh, and I think that is why many people, many Egyptians, are very concerned, very alarmed uh, that what is happening right now is simply a change in the names and the 
faces of this government, but not a fundamental change in the way this government does business. And that is what's more important. I think ordinary protesters that are out in Tahrir Square every day are not so much concerned about who are the names that are taking these government positions. They want to see a fundamental change enshrined in the way Egypt does business from now on. And if that's the case, if Egypt does change, the new leaders of this country will emerge. These old people, these old faces that they say are just more of the same, uh, same continued policies. Well, Ayman Muhadin, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Cairo Bureau Chief for Al Jazeera English, thank you for being there, for reporting, and for your bravery. He was arrested uh, on Sunday for seven hours, detained. But uh, as with all many of his colleagues, and not only at Al Jazeera, uh, being hunted, feeling under siege very much as they try to be the eyes and ears um, of. Uh, as they try to be the eyes and ears of the world watching what's happening right now in 